to have you here. It is exactly 10 past nine and we're going to try and stick to time as much as possible. So we're going to make a start. Firstly, hello and welcome. My name is Mumtaz and I'm a current ST1 trainee and it's an absolute pleasure to be hosting this day. I'd like to start by saying a really, really big thank you to everyone who's been involved. Usually this is a face-to-face -face event, so it's taken a lot of work to turn this into a virtual programme and hopefully one which you'll all find interesting and exciting. Um, I'd like to say a particular big thank you to Sarah and Priyan, who've been absolutely amazing in putting this all together. And I'm going to hand over the, to them now to say a quick hello as well. Really hope you enjoy the day. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah. Um, I'm an ST4. I've been organising uh, the induction day for a few years now and handing over to the wonderful Mumtaz um, this year. Um, it's been an interesting year with lots and lots of change, obviously making it virtual because of COVID. Um, so we've changed the programme a lot this year, but really hope that you enjoy it and get loads out of it, um, and that it's fun and useful, um, and enjoy it. Cool. And hi everyone, I'm Pri, uh, I'm a ST5. Uh, I haven't really done much to organise this, so Mumtaz and Sarah should definitely get all of the credit. Uh, I'm resident IT support, so if you have any issues with the tech, then I'm the one to blame. Um, but please do contact me and I'll try and sort it out. Pri's been an absolute IT hero, it would not be possible without him. Um, right, so firstly, big congratulations on getting here. It's absolutely incredible that you are all joining the London School of Paediatrics and we're so happy to have you here. We're going to kickstart this morning with Dr. Jonathan Round and his introduction and welcome to the school. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks, I'm just trying to get my microphone working. Can you hopefully you can all hear me? And yeah, yeah got some got some uh, and I'll just do some share screens uh, while my technology slowly fires itself into life. Um, can I just say this? What you're seeing here is a fairly typical event uh, for the London School of Paediatrics in that, that the trainees are really, really uh, central to what actually happens um, in the London School of Paediatrics. This is not something that has been put together by some TPDs and we've wheeled out Sarah and Mumtaz uh, to try and front it. No, this is actually very typical that actually Sarah has taken this on for several years and put together some excellent um, uh, packages and uh, training in the, in the uh, introduction and Mumtaz has taken that over this year and is working with her. And so, you know, if you like today and it, it's a good day, that's because of what those guys have been doing. So uh, I'm really, really impressed with that. It's a very exciting program um, that you've hopefully had a look through. Unfortunately, it's not going to be really quite everything we'd, we'd really want for you, because actually uh, the London School of Paediatrics is um, actually rather different to most other schools. We'll talk about that in a moment. But um, as I was thinking this morning, about the uh, slogan for Barcelona Football Club, and they call them, uh, I can't speak Spanish, but this mes que un club, which means more than a club. And uh, this paediatrics, it's more than a school. It's, uh, this is something about a family. Um, this is something where you'll get it becoming, uh, joining to something that's like a club, but it's like a family as well. And it's like a job and it's like a calling all at once. And uh, we very much wanted to welcome you into that uh, this morning. Uh, traditionally, we go to uh, the Marquis uh, of Granby or whatever it's called, uh, local to um, the uh, Stuart House where we'd meet up and have some drinks and get to know you better. But unfortunately, that will have to wait to some extent. So uh, with that very brief um, overview there, um, can I just ask, um, I, I can see actually nobody on my screen at all. Can you see my slides? Sarah, you're the only person I can actually see. Uh, can <laughs> I can see your slides. You can see my slides. So if I yeah. do that, does it advance? It's advanced, yeah. Fantastic. OK, good. So this, this is not the London School of Paediatrics. I tried to choose an image that was very much the opposite of, um, of, of what actually the London School of Paediatrics at least means to me. Uh, first of all, you can't actually find the London School of Paediatrics other than virtually and in relationships and in networks and websites and things like that. Uh, we sort of have a base at Stuart House, although that's pretty much empty. That's just in uh, Russell Square in central London. And probably in the future, we'll end up going back there uh, for various things. Uh, the London School of Paediatrics is um, Health Education England funded. So your taxes um, go to pay for that. 
and uh, they pay for a whole load of different things in there. Uh, first of all, they pay for a wonderful team of uh, support staff that actually make sure that you, uh, you've got rotations to go to, that the hospitals that you're coming to know about you, that you get paid, all these sorts of things. So I, I don't know if Luke's out there, but um, Luke's um, a superstar. Um, they've got Halima and Dorothy as well, who are also in that team, uh, people that actually make uh, your training actually happen. Now, beyond that, um, that group of people, we've also got two hugely important and influential um, uh, uh, gatherings of people. First of all, there's a specialist training committee and the people that you're seeing who put this together are part of that. And this is a real distinctive of the London School of Paediatrics, as opposed to most other schools that you'll find in London and across the country, is just how much the trainees are involved in the shape and the direction of what happens to paediatric training um, and well, it's your training. So our philosophy is that you should be involved in and controlling actually what happens with it. Of course, there are some regulations and restrictions um, around that. Uh, and it's this group of the TPDs, that's training program directors, all 24 of them. I'll introduce them in a sec. Um, but it's their job is to try and help you navigate your way through all of these different regulations and have a fantastic training career at the end of it. So that's really what the London School of Paediatrics is. Um, it's the biggest um, in London. It's also the biggest in the country. Um, the people actually on uh, online now represent a third of the new starters in paediatrics right across um, England. So, you know, it's, and, and not surprisingly, we're meant to punch uh, heavy. We punch well above our weight, we think. And there's a number of ways in which we lead. Many different things are going on in the country. So welcome to that. Now, um, I, I just kind of was wondering actually why people go into paediatrics. Um, this is the sort of reason I think that many medical students uh, think that uh, paediatrics is a good idea because uh, children are generally quite cute. And uh, here's a very cute baby. This is actually my daughter, um, age about, hmm, I think she's about an hour old at that stage. She's 26 now um, and uh, actually a medical student herself. But um, a lot of people go into paediatrics because they think that paediatrics uh, that paediatrics pedi basically means you can play with cute children um, all day. And there's definitely some of that. Um, so if you that's why you're here. Uh, well, you will see some of that. Um, but there's, of course, plenty of other things going on as well. Often people ask me what I like about paediatrics and, and beyond my colleagues and the interesting medicine. Actually, it's that I do like the people I work with, my patients, and I think they're fun to interact with. So I really would encourage you just to try, if you haven't much experience with children but have come into paediatrics for some other reason, that you think, actually, uh, let's just spend some time with this patient group and see how much fun they can be. Um, I actually went into paediatrics because I was kind of baffled by paediatrics. I didn't do very much at my medical school. And uh, do, during an A&E job, I was quite scared by children, but then realized actually, perhaps trying to understand something I didn't really um, naturally get very easily might be fun. And uh, it was certainly quite a challenge. And then I became more and more absorbed about it. And uh, that became my career. So I think the paediatrics, so beyond working with cute children and trying to understand things are hidden, um, is actually enormous fun because actually it's the biggest breadth specialty by a mile. And whoever you are, you will find a home somewhere within the world of paediatrics. I've put this photograph in there. Again, it's my daughter. She's about uh, three or four hours old now and proudly displaying a Morrow reflex and that she weighs 2.66 kilos. And there's her midwife. And um, so this is something that paediatrics is very distinct in. Of course, our patients grow. Some are very small, some are very big, uh, some are developing, uh, some have, have got issues with development. But all the different specialties are in there. Some are very academic, our trainees and our consultants. Uh, some are much more down to earth and uh, community based and some are academic and community based. So really, whoever you are, you will find a home here. One of the challenges, though, when I talk to medical students about uh, paediatrics is actually how do you cope with a very sick child? And uh, this photograph kind of illustrates just how sick a child can be. This, this child's um, on uh, a paediatric intensive care unit, um, life very much in the balance um, there. 
He's got his favourite uh, fluffy toy on him there, but he's on renal support, ventilation, inotropes, and a number of other things as well. How do you cope in a situation like that? Well, for some of you, this might be quite new. And in fact, some of you might ex experience some stuff like this fairly early on. Patients who are extremely sick seem to come in through the front door of most A&Es and sometimes with great regularity. Some children go on to die. This is a fairly unusual situation within paediatrics, but I think it can be particularly traumatic. Now, I emphasised early on that um, paediatrics is uh, a family specialty, and it's not just the patients that are family, but actually it's also um, the, uh, the people around you. So make sure that if you're in any sort of issue where you're, you're upset with stuff, you're finding it all too difficult, um, that actually you spend time talking to people and explaining what's going on. Because that's actually how we get through this together. We all have times like that. And I should probably tell you that that's, um, that chap in the photograph there has gone on to make a fantastic recovery and is now a college student. Um, moving on, uh, one of the other challenges isn't just the work, but actually um, the work um, in that it's actually pretty tiring. Um, and again, this is something that you may not be uh, that familiar with, depending on where you've done your F jobs. Um, but actually, it's pretty hard work. And again, we need to work together to, uh, to help you get through that. If things are getting too much for you, please let people know. You've got educational supervisors, people around you as well, colleagues. We're here to help. OK, we're here to help. And there's lot, lots that can be done. Uh, one of the things that you'll find it particularly important about is getting decent sleep and uh, good shift work. And one thing we couldn't possibly cancel from this session was um, our uh, wonderful Mike Farquhar, who's a sleep specialist from Evelina Children's Hospital, who will be doing a session on that. So I'm looking forward to that as well. I always find it possibly the best talk I ever go to. So hopefully that'll be fun. Now, um, lots of different problems afflict us uh, from time to time, but again, do raise these. Um, there's really no stigma attached to um, having any of these problems. Um, although this is, I think, a list I stole from an immigration um, document and, uh, and added there. But really, anything that's going on, please let us know. And that's the, your, your local team. So my last bit is who's who, and um, this is uh, these are the TPDs. These are people who are actually paid by HEE to help you in your training. And uh, we've got this wonderful team now that have um, uh, sprung up from different uh, sources to do different aspects and specialise on different aspects of support in your training. I won't name them all um, individually, but I will just pick out a few um, in there. Um, We've got different ones that support things like simulation. Uh, we've got someone who's just looking at innovative patterns of working. Uh, we've got uh, some do, who are program managers. We've got some that support our IT groups as well. But I'm going to pick out just two groups that are going to be particularly useful. The ones here, um, this is uh, Khadija, who's um, on your sort of middle. Um, let's just make you bigger. There we go. So hopefully that's that better there. Hopefully that's better. Um, so Khadija here um, on the left hand side, um, she's the ST1 to 3 program manager TPD for Northwest London. So you may be having interactions with her. You couldn't find a lovelier person to work with, except possibly Olu, who's down at the bottom here, who does the same role, ST1 to 3 um, program coordinating TPD for North Central and East London. And your last person on this list is uh, Ruth Shepherd, who's down at the bottom there and uh, looks after South London, ST1 to 3 again. Um, she's also the deputy head of school. Um, so um, I, I have far too much work to do to run this school. If it weren't for these amazing people, I, I would actually collapse. But Ruth and uh, Anne, who's um, just next to Khadija here, um, these are the two deputy heads of school, and they are invaluably brilliant people who um, do so much work uh, on behalf of yourselves. Um, two other people I just need to introduce you to, and um, these are the academic TPDs. So if you're an academic um, trainee, uh, welcome. Uh, we hope you have a really good experience here. Uh, these are the guys you need to work with. Um, they're very cheerful looking chap. I'm not sure what he's just been awarded or uh, why he's so happy, but um, he's Chris Gale. He's a neonatologist um, from Chelsea and Westminster, 
and uh, one of the academic TPDs. And down in the bottom right hand corner is Sandy Anake, and she is a gastroenterologist from the Royal London. So those are the two um, people that you need to um, interact with. So I haven't actually got anything more I wanted to say um, at this stage, but except welcome. Um, please ask, please get involved in the family. Um, have a fantastic time in your training and I'll be around just after lunch for some Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jonathan, um, for that. It's wonderful, um, as always, to hear you talking. Um, next, we're going to hear from Dr. Ruth Shepherd, who uh, Jonathan just introduced, who's going to talk to you about the nitty gritty of your paediatric training. Thanks so much, Ruth. So um, thank you very much. I'm actually going to repeat a little bit of what Jonathan has covered. Um, so my day job is a consultant neonatologist at St. Helier in um, South London. And like everybody else, it's a pleasure to welcome you here today. So we are going on a whistle stop tour of important information that really you need to know ideally around Monday. Um, don't worry, you don't need to take notes. The presentation is going to be uploaded by the fantastic Pre. At the end of my presentation, I've included lots of links, which I also see um, have many of them have also been included uh, on the resource pack already. And you can either ask me questions at the end of this in our Q&A session later or just email me. So you have started on the RCPCH training programme. It's an eight year programme divided into three levels. Level one is the junior level and you need to pass all your exams before you move on to levels two and three, which are middle grade um, posts. There are proposed changes um, that would result in this being a two level system, but the uh, date for implementation has not been confirmed and um, both the RCPCH and us will inform you uh, if that uh, becomes clearer. So what about London? Well, in London, as Jonathan mentioned, we have um, three sectors at level one, North Central, and East London, North West London and South London. And then at level two, we divide you just into North and South London. And up to the end of level two, you remain in sector. Um, but in level three, you can work anywhere in London. It's a pan London programme. Uh, so you maximise your training opportunities. So at level one training, we plan your programmes to give you experience in general paediatrics, um, neonatal and subspecialty paediatrics. All your rotations are slightly different and they give you different experiences, but they all include the essential training. For the majority of you um, have already got indicative posts for two or three years, um, some of you for only one year. And the reason for that is that we have more posts at ST1 than we do at ST2 and 3, because some people decide paediatrics is not for them. And if you happen to be in the rotation that hasn't got your full programme yet, we are very experienced at managing this and we will give you your posts usually by the end of your ST1 year. Um, for those of you who are academic clinical fellows, you will work with particularly Sandy and Nyack to work out your placements in ST um, 2 and 3 and when you take your academic block. But you need to also be in touch with the um, TPD for your sector so that everything is um, um, coordinated in a better way. Um, at this point, I just want to mention the big word that says provisional. We try to keep your rotations pretty much like the information we give you at the beginning. But um, sometimes events mean that we need to make changes either for your training purposes or um, as in the case of those of you who are in North Central London, because there may be service reconfiguration plans. But the priority is still to maintain your training um, experience. So as Jonathan said, um, there are three of us working at level one. We actually chat to each other a great deal. 
Um, if you have an issue or a query or a concern, just email us. Everybody's good on email. So we really want to help you achieve the best possible outcomes um, during your training. Um, but all of you are adults and um, life may lead to changes in your circumstances. So please tell us and keep us informed if any of these happen. Um, there are many more examples. We are very happy to try and help you, but we can only help you if you um, are able to contact us. Now, sometimes people want a particular job because it's their major interest, for example, oncology, but it's not on their rotational programme. And if a post becomes vacant and somebody has expressed a desire to do that post and we can move you into that post, then we will. But we can only do that if we know the posts are going to become vacant. So, um, so if you are pregnant and you're going on maternity leave or if you're sick or you're going to take time out of programme, please tell us so that we can reallocate the posts uh, to trainees who may be um, wanting to do them. We work um, pretty far in advance and so we are already planning the March rotations because we need to give the trust at least uh, 13 weeks notice. So by the end of October, the March posts are pretty much sorted. So don't come to us a few weeks before because in fact everything will, will have been um, signed and confirmed with the trust at that stage. We do not allow trainees to contact somebody else whose post they want and say, please give it to me, my life will be terrible if you don't give it to me. Um, one person always feels put upon and usually complains. And actually, you may not know all the training requirements that you need or that that person needs. If you want to do a different post or have a particular interest, please contact your TPD. We have lots and lots of trainees who work less than full time. Um, and that starts at ST1 and, and the numbers increase as we go through the programme. Because of that, we usually place trainees in slot share posts. So you have to work with each other to cover the whole um, working week. Now, I would say that um, level one training is all about children. Seeing them when they're well, when they're sick, seeing those who have additional needs. Um, you'll see really common conditions, rare conditions, and you'll learn to play with your patients, watch um, children's TV programmes, become experts in uh, subjects that you didn't much know about, like the current favourite toys. You'll work with your um, friends, your colleagues, their families and a much wider team. And paediatrics is very much a team sport and you need your colleagues to help you all achieve the best for your patients. But what do you need to learn? Well, currently we are um, using the RCPCH curriculum, which is called PROGRESS. And PROGRESS has um, very clearly defined outcomes for levels one, two and three. And at each stage you need to um, evidence that you have knowledge in 11 domains. So 11 domains at level one, 11 at level two and 11 at level three. And if you happen to do grid training or subspecialty training, you also have um, outcomes for that too. The idea is that it's like a spiral. So you learn um, all the domains at the next at, the, at level one, and then you build on that through level two and further develop um, in level three. Now, of course, uh, we can sit and teach you, um, but that doesn't mean that you have learned anything and it doesn't mean that you have understood what we are trying to explain. So we need you to show us um, how much you've learned and to evidence that. And the way that you do that is using something called ePortfolio, which is an educational tool on the RCPCH website. Now, paediatrics is great, um, but 
when you mention assessments, there's usually a bit of a groan. A groan from you because you need to do the assessments and a groan from your trainers who are usually asked just before um, your annual review to do lots and lots of assessments um, when none have been done previously. My advice to you is to try and start early and do them regularly because in fact your weeks will whiz by without you realising. E-portfolio also allows you to look at where you've done well and where you need to do a bit more work or things that you're not so sure of, and that will help direct your learning as well. The pedi paediatric exam is called MRCPCH. It has four parts, three written papers and a clinical exam. Doctors as a group are bright, hardworking, high achieving individuals who have high standards for themselves and others. And you will have done lots of exams to get to this stage. But have a look at the pass marks and you will see that actually sometimes they're really quite low, um, particularly the TAS. And for the majority of you, you will need to retake at least one part of the exam. Start doing exams as soon as you can, and I know some have already done some parts of the exam during foundation years. Um, there's loads of help available, both online in books and from your colleagues. If you have dyslexia or think you might have dyslexia, then you can get um, an assessment done uh, via the professional support unit that I'll talk about in a minute, and that will help you implement changes um, that will benefit not only your day to day life, but also your professional life. So how much do you actually need to do? Well, this is the 2019 um, assessment table from the RCPCH and I see it's also in your um, resources. There were some amendments for 2020 due to COVID, but if I were you, I would aim to do as many of the things as is in this table. Um, really to improve your overall learning rather than just be a tick, tick box exercise. So there are lots of people involved in your training, as Jonathan mentioned. Um, the GMC registers you, uh, it regulates you and it revalidates you. So this means that you need to fill a very um, important bit of paper, which is now online called a Form R each year in which you tell us the number of days that you have had out of training, which is a number, um, not a series of dates. They also ask if you've been involved in any incidents, if you've had any complaints, but also importantly, if you've had any compliments um, and thank yous are an important part of life. COPMED is the Conference of Postgraduate Medical Teens and they produce a very important document called the Gold Guide, which is like the little Bible of um, training advice. And currently we're on the eighth edition and you can um, look that up. And if you have any queries about training, go to the Gold Guide because that is uh, going to give you the best advice. The RCPCH is our college. Um, it develops a curriculum progress, which has been approved by the GMC. It also uh, organises your exams and assessments and all of us who are paediatricians need to be in good standing with our college and that's not just whilst you're in training, that is uh, forever. The London School of Paediatrics in the Middle is part of Health Education England and um, as Jonathan said, they really work on the admin aspects um, to support you in your posts. We all work at a number of trusts and these are the trusts in London on the right hand side and on the left hand side is one of the gatherings in previous times and you'll see a few familiar faces there. Each year you have an assessment of your uh, work and your ability to progress and the ARCP checks two things. First of all, whether you can remain registered with the GMC and secondly, whether you can progress in training for the RCPCH. And the ARCP is carried out by panels of consultants from um, London. 
you will have an ARCP every single year unless you're on statutory leave. So if you um, think you haven't heard about it, then check because you would expect to be assessed every year. The paediatric team send you a very long email with lots of important links. And honestly, if you start at the beginning of the email and work your way through, you will be absolutely fine. Um, this is your professional responsibility and it is very important. And if you don't do this, it can affect your registration with the GMC. Now, progression is achieved by demonstrating capabilities, not by how many weeks or months you spent in a particular post. The vast majority of you will get a satisfactory outcome, an outcome one, and we don't need to see you. It's all done in absentia. That means that everything that we assess needs to be on your e-portfolio, and if it's not there, we can't assess it. If you get an unsatisfactory outcome, then we invite you to come and meet us and discuss the outcome. And currently we've done that um, over um, Zoom meetings. And that's an opportunity for us to talk about what's going on, what the implications of a poorer outcome are, and to offer support. And if you want more information about ARCPs, then go to the Goal Guide. So come Monday morning, I expect that you will have a whole load of emotions. Um, now, you are also adults and you are professionals with many different aspects to your life. And some are more important to you than others, and the most important one may vary over time. You do have to decide which is going to be your priority, um, as it's not normally possible to do everything, um, despite our best wishes. And life is about making compromises. So um, do have a think about it, because it is important that you get it to work uh, for you as well. At work, there are lots of tips and guides to help you. Um, this one is actually from the Welsh Deanery, but there are uh, lots of other um, publications and online resources um, to help you. And work is hard um, sometimes. It's tiring and it's emotionally difficult, and it's also challenging if you've got other things going on. So um, trying to get some sleep, trying to find an opportunity to do some exercise and trying to take care of yourself are all really important. In your trust, um, there is a great deal of support. You should aim to meet your educational supervisor within the first two weeks, really so that you get to know them, you can develop a personal development plan and you can find out how your department ticks. Every trust has at least one college tutor and the tertiary units have tutors for general or specialty paediatrics and neonates separately, although sometimes they work as a little um, team. The tutor should be your first point of contact if, tissue, if issues arise with your training. Um, in your trusts, the postgraduate medical centres or education centres and the directors of medical education are also there to help you. In the school, you can get support from that are now 24 TPDs, heads of school, the paediatric team and lots of other resources. And we can be contacted by email, chat to you on the phone or meet you in one of our training contact meetings. And we have training contact meetings with um, one or more of the deputy he of the heads of school and training programme directors at least once a month. The um, London Deanery has this fantastic resource called the Professional Support Unit and it covers a whole range of um, really fantastic um, support services including coaching, one-to-one um, -one support, helping you return to work and specialist services, communication, resilience, linguistic skills, exam skills and dyslexia. It's free to you, but you do need to apply. Just going to whiz through a couple of um, specific areas that you can read later. We have lots of full time training. Currently, it is only for those who are in category one, which is health and um, care responsibilities, or category two, which is um, 
really unique opportunities. We did have a, as a pilot for anybody to apply and that stopped due to COVID, but we hope it will restart. We have lots of maternity leave here. Um, if you go on maternity leave, the programme continues. And if you want to come back full time, then we try to pop you back on the same rotations, but we don't guarantee that. If you return less than full time, you'll normally be in a slot share post. Um, children are unwell at all times of the day and night, every single day of the year. And we would expect that trainees will work out of hours unless there's a specific health reason not to do so. And that decision is not made by us, but by occupational health at the trust. There are lots of opportunities to take time out of programme. Um, it's important to think about the employment implications if you take a break from NHS service. If you're going to go out of programme, think about what you hope to achieve. Read the information and also read the gold guide. If you go out of programme, then um, there is support to help you return to the um, training. Interdisciplinary transfers are um, where you start in one part of the country but move to another. And there has to be an unforeseen and significant change in circumstances to allow that to happen. There are pretty strict rules about um, IDTs, which are clearly explained um, on the website and also in the goal guide. It's not an entitlement. And even if you tick all the boxes, there needs to be a vacancy that you can move into if, um, if you are able to move. Um, and this is my final slide. So um, I like the one at the bottom. Um, and this is actually a community pediatrician who spent an hour assessing a five-year-old. And at the end of the hour, the child looked up at him and said, do you go to work sometimes? So for a lot of our time, our work is really fun and um, we do amazing things. Uh, so have a great time and enjoy yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ruth, for such a wonderful talk. Um, I'm now going to hand over to some members of the training committee. So as I'm sure you've gathered, the training committee is an absolutely amazing thing that we have here in and I'm going to hand over to Sarah and Pree to begin with, and they'll introduce the other members of the committee who are joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, Mumtaz. Um, so, Sarah, um, I've introduced myself already at the beginning. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Sarah. I'm an ST5 um, PS Reg, currently working at the Whittington, but moving to St George's um, next week. Um, and Preen and I have been co-chairs of the London School of Paediatrics Trainees Committee for about 18 months now. Um, and we wanted to welcome you all here. Uh, and we've made a video which seemed like a good idea at the time. But on reflection, it's very embarrassing and cringy. So come and cringe with us, won't you? Hey. Hey, Preen. How are you going? I'm all right. How are you doing? Yeah. Yeah, not too bad. So... Montez has asked us to do this talk for the new ST okay. ones. Mm. Any thoughts? Yeah, so it's so the new piece trains, right? So we need to work out what they need to know, right? So we've what we've been in PEDS ten years between the both of us. Yeah. So we must have something in that time, right? Yeah, it's like the decade. We've obviously we've obviously learned um, stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I can, will we make a list of stuff we've learned? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we don't need to make the list now. We don't no, make yeah, fine, we can do yeah, that later. We'll make the list later. I, I guess what we can do now is work out what they need to know. Yeah. And they're starting, exactly. right? Exactly, yeah. Um, and what is useful for people who are starting these. Um, yeah. Any ideas? Um, so a child that is a small adult, that's what I've learned. Um, they also come in like a really compact form um, like baby is what they yeah. yeah. refer to as. Yeah. Uh, they, that tends to feature heavy in the workload. Um, mm. In terms of training, um, where are you going? What are you doing? 
Mm. But yeah, they need to know where, where to go. Mm -hmm. And I guess, so we should probably tell them a little bit about the London School of Pediatrics, right? Because that's where they're. Yeah, 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 totally. Um, and I guess since we've been chairs of the training committee the last 18 months, we should probably tell them a bit, a bit about that and kind of explain what it is and, and, and yeah. why, you know, what it does. Um, yeah. And obviously, uh, yeah. like, we know that. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, Wouldn't be. Yeah. Um, so um, just remind me again, the London School of Pediatrics, that's um, when the owl comes with the letter, is it? And then you go to King's Cross platform. Nine, is that? I, I, have the, I didn't have an owl. Oh. I didn't get. Am I, is I it? Oh, that's how it works. I'm always, I'm always between. Oh, OK, cool. No, no okay, I didn't. Like, the, the other one. The other yeah, the other, it's the other one, right? Um, the yeah. one with the, the two blue blobs, you know, the big blob and the little blob. Ah, oh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Hagrid, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Fab. We should, I guess, maybe we should. So before the day, before Friday, we should work out again a little bit more. Maybe I think I think that's good. I think, I think we should have a bit more detail maybe about what what the London School is and, and why it's important. So maybe maybe we can look maybe we can write that down as something to look up before before we'll Friday. London School of Peace, what is it? Yeah. Exactly. Training committee. Who day? The London School of Pediatrics is responsible for the training of pediatric trainees in London. It is made up of training program directors and the training permit who are responsible for the overall direction of the school and for many of the courses and activities on offer. And college teachers and trust who are the vital link between the school and local trusts. And then I guess the only other thing that's probably important is, is you know, where, where to get information about what's going on and 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 about pediatrics and teaching and stuff like that right mm -hmm. that's yeah yeah so like faxes is that how people are Beliefs, faxes, fa yes. Beliefs and faxes that's probably the best way to get information from what i've learned from work so and then there's a website right oh yeah that sounds good so it's yeah we should we should, we should give should them a bit of info about that website yeah okay. i looked that up is that now when you say website is that the same as the tickety talk that i've seen the kids on tickety -talk? Tick talk yes um instagram yeah twitter bebo yes yes and this will do that and um what was that other one called myspace that's all the kids are using right so we'll, we'll share all our platforms with them yeah. but mainly the website and that's that, that, yeah, and the website's Wikipedia because obviously it's pediatric. It's about peds. Oh, they've got to have you, Brian. You're really on the ball here. Yeah. I don't want to overstate it, but I think we're basically crushing it. I think we've done it. Smashed it. Yeah, cool. basically. They'll be sorted. Yeah. They All won't right. know what hit them. Cool. I'll see you Friday. Yeah, see you Friday. Bye. Bye. Please, please don't use Wikipedia. Use the London School of Pediatrics website for information about training, including ARCPs and UPs, and news about events and courses. So thank you for sitting through that very cringy video that was 100% saved by Pri and Son, adding the cuteness factor. Okay. Um, um, chatting about the prevalence of communication difficulties. I'm going to be talking about um, common causes of speech and language difficulties in children and also um, what typical communication. Sorry, that was my fault. <laughs> um, so we just wanted to talk you through the website that we have um, for the London School of Peds because actually a lot of information you need as a new trainee is on there and it's the type of thing that's updated regularly and you can come uh, at as you need it. Um, so Preen's got control there, but you can see all the tabs at the top. So 
current trainees is a, a useful place to go as someone who's starting. A lot of these resources were also included in the pack that um, Mumtaz and Sarah created for you. But if you look along the tabs at the left hand side, you can go through them in your own time. But exams, a lot of the information that Ruth has just given you is in there. Uh, workplace based assessments um, features there, including the table of things you kind of the assessments that you need to complete before the end of the year. Um, so you can choose the one there for ST1. Um, and then as you get uh, further on in your training, A or CP at the end of the year, there's information about that. Applying for out of programme experience. Um, uh, and then if you are coming back from an out of programme experience or training time out or maternity leave, there's all information about returning to clinical practice. This website is all created and maintained by trainees. Um, so let us know if there's anything that needs updating on it. And you can also contribute to the website. Um, so if you're running an event or you've heard about an event that's very good and you want to let other trainees know about it, you can share your news at the top there. And when you go on the home page, the news kind of goes across. To do that, though, the only thing you do need to do is um, kind of subscribe to the website. So um, if you click on subscribe and try and use an NHS.net uh, web uh, email address, it will work uh, automatically and you'll be able to post and things like that on it. It will also provide you with a um, a regular newsletter with a summary of the news of things that are going on um, in London Peds. Um, and they're the predominant areas. The other thing is just um, the tab about the TC um, trust reps and TPDs. So when you go to your new trust, um, if you want to become a trust rep, we very much encourage that. We try to have an SHO and a reg um, uh, from each post, depending on the numbers involved. But sometimes people feel apprehensive because they haven't been a trust rep before in the London School of Peds. If you click on trust rep information, there's information about that um, with the little handbook there of what to do and when the meetings are and things like that. Um, at the moment, the meetings are virtual, but hopefully we'll get them back face to face at some point. Um, in 2021. The other thing just to mention is um, the trainees committee. We're currently recruiting um, for new people to join the trainees committee. So do join. I joined when I was ST1 um, and really enjoyed it. Um, and Mumtaz, you can see here, who's arranging the day is also a current ST1. So you can have a read through of all the different projects. Um, there's also uh, websites kind of associated uh, with the London School of Peds as well. So one of them is the MRCPCH Clinical Revision a website, which is really fantastic. There's lots of resources there about preparing for your clinical exam, divided up by system there, videos um, and kind of Word documents talking you through various things. And then the other thing which I would really recommend subscribing to is um, Pediatric FOMED, which has a lots of um, kind of short snippet articles about various different topics, often written by trainees. Similarly, you can submit stuff um, for it as well. It's often a trainee combined with a consultant and they're really just nice things. I get them on my email and you can just flick through it as you're commuting into work and get a nice snippet about a certain topic um, that you may not know all that much about. Um, so I think that's the majority of what we wanted to say. In addition, welcome to London School of Peds. We were very much enjoying it, despite our cringy videos. Um, if you have any questions or anything like that, just let us know. Uh, there's an email on the website, I should have said, uh, that you can just email through when it comes to Priyan and I, um, and we'll do our best to help you if we can. Perfect. Um, yeah, and the, I just encourage you to subscribe to the newsletter because that's where you'll find out about the different courses, events that are on offer, um, and news about the school, about ARCPs and things like that will come through there. You'll get some uh, communications from HE um, and through other channels, but you'll get it usually quicker and uh, in more volume um, from the London School website. And then despite obviously our, our spoof video, um, things like Twitter are actually quite a good way if you're on Twitter um, of finding out the latest information about um, different courses and events. Um, so I'm just going to hand over to Steph uh, now who's uh, part of the surviving and thriving subgroup of the trainees committee um, and who runs the pediatric families project um, project mm -hmm. which is going to talk to you about, to you about. and then after that is um, Katie Burley who's part of the education subgroup 
of the Trains Committee, um, who's going to talk to you about some of the amazing courses and um, on offer. Um, Steph. Morning, I'm Steph. Um, I just wanted to say welcome to the London School of Paediatrics. It's wonderful to have so many people here and amazing job to Mumtaz and Sarah and everybody else who's helped for making it so great. Um, the only reason why I wanted two minutes of your time is I run the Paediatric Family Project, which many of you will have received a lot of emails about. Um, and what we do is we match you as an ST1 with a registrar um, of an ST4 level or above to help you kind of guide you through the first year of your training as an informal mentor. Um, we usually try and match you within the same hospital. So it's somebody you'll see on a regular basis. And then if there's any problems, we're always on hand to help you out. Um, so the reason why I wanted to speak to you right now is that if any of you haven't signed up and would like an informal mentor, all I need you to do is email me, preferably, preferably by the end of today, so that I can try and slot you into a family before you start work next week. So if you would like to be part of it, if you could just email me on paediatricfamilies at gmail.com, I'll put it in the chat, um, and I will add you to a family really soon. And I look forward to meeting you as all as soon as possible. Uh, have a wonderful day. Katie, are you logged on? Yes, I am. Sorry, I'm a bit late. Um, welcome. It's so lovely to um, have a whole host of new people joining the London School of Paediatrics. Um, I hope you enjoy your time here. I'm sure people have said already um, it's a really wonderful place to train. Um, uh, I was asked just to come and talk to you about some of the education opportunities that we have here in London as part of the school. Um, I'm a member of the education um, subgroup from the London School of Paediatrics and um, we firmly believe that most of the education you're going to get during your training is going to be in your trusts. Um, but we run a few um, mostly pan London programs to try and support some of the skills that might be slightly harder to get um, in the workplace. Um, as Pri said, I strongly advise you to go and look at the website, um, look at the education pages and see what we have running. Um, uh, um, and join the newsletter as well, because a lot of our updates get sent out in the newsletter. Um, at the moment, we're running some online teaching, um, which I strongly advise you to log into um, if you can. Um, from September, it's going to run twice a week on Tuesday and Thursday, lunch times at one. Um, and all the login information can be found, um, I think, in the pack that Mumplas has sent you, um, but also on the school pages. Um, we're going to be doing it mostly um, around themes. Um, so we have some regional training in normal times um, in conjunction with the RSM. Um, uh, and um, it's on sort of topics that you'll come up um, uh, that will come up in paediatrics, like cardiology, gastroenterology, um, and the th online learning is going to be around those themes. Um, we've also got some online training days, um, again in conjunction with the RSM, um, uh, for the autumn that hopefully will be face to face um, in the spring. And all the information for those is also on the website. Um, we run lots of different courses. Um, historically, they have been um, geared at different training levels, but I, I really believe that um, most of them are applicable for all levels of training. Um, we had specific um, ST1 um, sector based case training um, that was running before COVID that we're hoping to get up and running online um, this autumn. So um, keep checking the website for updates on that. Um, as well as our other courses um, and um, other things we run are um, QI change champions. Um, we run some leadership and management training and um, we run some trial bereavement training. Um, we run some training around different transition points. Um, so there's there's lots and lots of things and I won't overwhelm you. Um, I also wanted to say that a lot of our training and courses is run by um, volunteers. Um, so if any of you are particularly interested in getting involved, maybe in a specific project or helping out with some of the online teaching, um, then uh, please do contact um, one of us. We always love um, new and enthusiastic people. Um, and I think that's all from me. Oh, one last thing I wanted to mention is that we also have on our education pages um, some workplace packs. Um, which have um, 
work tasks like communication scenarios or small quizzes, um, group discussions um, around some of the um, topics in paediatrics that can also be found on that you can do in your trusts to help you meet some of your um, curriculum um, competencies. Um, so check those out as well as those of um, useful resources that they signpost to um, from other societies and, and um, uh, other educational pages. I think that's it. Um, it's really lovely to see you all. I hope you enjoy um, your time here um, and just let me know if you've got any questions. Great, thank you so much, um, everybody. It's uh, always amazing to hear about all the uh, great opportunities that there are within um, the PEDS training um, with the trainees committee and families and all the other communities. Um, we are now going to hear from Dr. Chris Harris, um, who is going to talk to you about surviving neonates, which I know from the um, survey that you've all completed is one of your big fears about starting your PEDS training. Um, and I'm sure it's going to be an exciting and insightful talk. Um, so thanks very much, Chris. Thank you very much. I'm just going to try and share a screen. Uh, 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 that's very annoying. Um, what I just have to do is sign out of Teams and then sign back in. I'm so sorry. Give me just two minutes and Speak I'll do that. Presentation. You can see the screen? Yeah. Yeah, I can oh, see it. Perfect. No, that's wonderful. Um, there's a very cute baby that's far more attractive than my face um, on Teams. So um, I was going to talk to you um, just briefly um, about uh, neonatology. Uh, we know that um, people are very scared uh, very frightened of coming to neonates um, and really uh, I want to try and convince you over the next 15-20 minutes that you don't need to be scared um, and so to do that um, I was going to give a, uh, a brief chat about neonatal life support, a bit of a talk about the people that you'll meet on the neonatal unit um, and how to go about um, managing your first days uh, as you join your new trusts. Um, it's um, a very odd time at the moment, I would say, in, in hospital life in general. And, and I think neonatology is very much caught up in um, the COVID um, situation, even if it's um, not a, a, a direct connection, as most of our babies don't have COVID. Um, but um, uh, in addition to um, uh, the patient worries, we also have a lot of worries about um, what effect it's having on the mums and the people who we interact with. And so, um, whilst COVID isn't always um, on the forefront of our minds, um, it has a direct impact on, on what we do. So, neonatal life support. Um, I know that at King's here we've been offering um, neonatal life support um, for uh, people who are joining as ST1s, and I hope that most people will have an opportunity to do that. Um, but if you don't, it's not, um, it, it's not the be all and end all. You don't need to worry um, too much because actually it will not all be on you as an SD1 um, going to uh, a delivery by yourself and resuscitating babies by yourself on your first day or immediately after induction. There is always, always someone to go with um, and we would um, hugely encourage you going with people. Um, but just to remember that, remember the basics. So dry the baby, stimulate the baby and then 99.99% of babies will get better with just that, um, which is really great. And that's what makes neonatology so wonderful. And um, you have a baby who looks a little bit blue, you give it a dry, give it a, a sugar, they start screaming and crying, everyone's happy and thinks you're a hero, even though all you've done is really just dried a baby, um, which is very good. But the other key thing to remember is that it is not the time to practice intubation for the first time. And um, there is always, in, in my experience, I've never seen a situation where it's necessary for the day one or two ST1 to put a, an ET tube down um, in, uh, in labor ward. There's always someone to call and it's far more important to focus on, on the basics. So you're going to be on a neonatal unit possibly with some sick babies. There's a lot of equipment. 
most of it, you're not going to know what it does on day one. We love abbreviations. Most of them you, you won't understand on the first day. The temptation when you think about all of this is to be a little bit nervous. And then when you get scared, you start panicking. You might think of some fluffy kittens, but you're not allowed to think about fluffy kittens because we're on neonatology. You have to think about cute babies. But cute babies get sick, so you can't think about them. So we're back to panicking. But actually, there's no need to panic because you have your registrar who stood beside you. And it's really important to recognise that in neonatology, probably more than any other specialty, it is incredibly registrar led. In fact, I'd almost say that in most neonatal units now, it's very consultant led. But your registrar is there to help you. And they should accompany you to, um, at, as a bare minimum, the first few deliveries. And I, when I was a registrar, I would be very happy to go along with SHOs for the first three to six months, if that's what it took for one of the SHOs to feel comfortable in labour ward. And we all remember what it was like on, uh, on our first day on the neonatal unit. Um, and so you can ask us whatever questions you want and, and we, we just won't be um, angry or upset. Um, and we would much rather be called to see the funny lump or the funny rash or, or whatever it is that's worrying you rather than you guys being stressed. Um, and that goes um, for the consultants as well. Um, and if you do feel unsupported by your registrar, then talk to a consultant on the unit. I'm a consultant here at King's. And if one of the SHOs feels that they're having a bad day and, and the, the registrar's maybe not understanding, then that's fine. I, I will happily, very happily um, go and see uh, go and see them, try and work things out. And, and very, very rarely um, do we need to step in, but we're very happy to do so. Our primary concern is that the babies have to be safe. Our secondary concern is that the people who work on the neonatal unit have to be happy. So what are you going to do on your first day? Well, there's some things that will help you um, to feel a little bit more confident and comfortable. Um, the first thing is to find the place that you're supposed to be in the first instance. And remember that um, not all neonatal units are called neonatal units. Some of them are called scaboos. Some of them are NICUs. Some of them have random ward names. Our, uh, one at King's is called the Fred Stoll unit. Um, so work out where the NICU is. Um, and go up and say hello. The other places that you need to know about are places like the labour ward, um, which is often fairly close to NICU, um, but also the postnatal ward as well. And one of the things that's come up is, is that we don't always call the neonatal crash team the neonatal crash team. And so it's worth um, working out what you have to run to and, and what you, you can ignore. Um, because uh, my crash bloop here goes off all the time and only one in a million of those are ones that where they actually want the, the neonatal team to come. So work out whether you're called the newborn team, the neonatal team or whether in fact um, a paediatric arrest um, on labour ward is, is the main uh, way of calling the emergency team. Um, have a look through um, the resuscitaire um, on labour ward. Um, and that will help you to find the bits of kit, how to switch it on, how to push go on, on the timers and how to get the oxygen blend OK. If you do that for the first time when you're not at an emergency, um, it's much easier. Um, and while you're on the labour ward, you can introduce yourself. Um, and the midwives are really your friends um, and they will help you hugely um, when you're um, attending deliveries and also doing screen and treats. And they can also be real allies in talking to parents, um, particularly around difficult topics, um, like when mums uh, are reluctant for things like vitamin K or antibiotics. It's also absolutely vital to find a place to have some lunch and some coffee. Um, I always suggest um, leaving the ward or the unit if you can, and if it's safe, um, and lunch and coffee and your well-being is very, very important. Um, and we certainly don't want anyone who's um, exhausted and tired and hungry um, and hangry uh, to be uh, struggling around on the neonatal ward. So a few words about labour ward, um, because we know that labour ward is a place full of fear, but there is no need to be worried or frightened. 
And the main reason for that is that you have registrars and the registrars will come and help you um, and they will um, help you uh, attending deliveries and they will also help you to deal with things like cannulas that need to be put in for antibiotics and also to decide whether babies need antibiotics as well. So on the labour ward, um, it's very important when you get called um, that you have two pieces of information. You must know the gestation and you must ask if there are any other problems um, known uh, about the baby. If, if people don't have time um, to, to tell you those two pieces of information, they should be putting out an arrest call and everyone should be going. Um, otherwise, they can always give you the gestation. If you don't know these things, it can be very difficult to make sure that the right people are attending um, at the right time. And if you um, go by yourself and then find out that there's a big problem, it can delay getting the actual skills that you need in labour ward um, a, as quickly as possible. If you are having difficulty, it is very important um, to put out a crash call early. Um, we never mind running to a crash call and then not being needed. In fact, I love running to the labour ward um, and then for everything to be fine because it means I don't need to go for a run in the evening. I don't need to go to the gym. That is my daily exercise. So put out crash calls early and we will come running and hopefully everything will still be fine. The postnatal ward. Again, a place filled with fear. Sadly, there is nothing that's really going to take away that fear. Most of us still look like this after many years when we get a call to the postnatal ward. But the thing is that the postnatal ward is incredibly important. And it's not just um, because you have to grin and bear it and get through it. And it's not just because it motivates you to get your exam so that you never have to go back as a registrar. Actually, the postnatal ward um, as a job is one of the most important things that we do as, as paediatricians and neonatologists. And, and that the reason being is that this is our one opportunity to check a baby over from head to toe and identify problems that might have a lasting effect for that baby if we don't act sooner. And that's not just the congenital abnormalities like imperforate anus and things like that, but also um, heart problems, eye problems, um, skin problems, all of these things that we can identify um, and plug babies into treatment early, um, which um, avoids uh, any, any long-term problems for those babies. And, and I thought I'd just mention some, something about postnatal depression because um, we're also in a unique um, position as neonatologists where we're having conversations and talking um, to mothers. Um, and actually, I think that that's um, really an important um, factor um, in, in, uh, uh, in the whole uh, process of postnatal care, um, that you can have a conversation with the mother, ask them how they're doing, and if there's problems, then you are not expected to fix those problems. Um, but certainly um, raising your concerns with the midwives looking after the mothers can be an important um, factor in identifying mums who, who have got postnatal depression. So assessments, again, um, fills people with fear. Um, but again, you don't need to worry. Um, and this is because as well as your neonatal registrar, um, you also have your neonatal consultant um, or Batman, although um, I read today that Batman's got COVID, so maybe stay away from him for uh, a little while. Um, but actually on the neonatal unit, there are a huge number of places where you can have assessments filled out. Um, everyone kind of understands the, the DOPS section of things where um, you put cannulas, possibly um, ET tubes on the NICU and um, various other things. Um, but also um, we have um, blood gases that we do quite regularly um, and we can use um, the, uh, the blood gases and the explanation of the blood gases um, as part of a, a mini kex. Um, we can also talk about TPN, jaundice, infections, discussions with families. Um, and when it comes to CBDs, um, there are often very interesting cases, but it's really important, particularly um, when you start, to also make sure that you, you cover the basics too. Um, and so things like prematurity, um, late preterm, 
early term. All of these things are interesting CBDs to cover and might help you regardless of whether you do neonatology um, in the future. Um, just a little word about um, dealing with um, death on the NICU. Um, it's, it's very sad but sometimes we, we do indeed see babies that, that die on the neonatal unit um, and it's okay to be sad when, when that happens and I'd say this goes for the whole of paediatrics in fact and in fact the whole of medicine. It's, it's okay to be sad when someone dies even if it's expected it is still okay to be sad and um, what's important is that because we know in medicine we are going to see death not infrequently and um, that we we develop um, mechanisms that help us to, to cope. Um, and some of those will be um, debrief, which is um, formal and informal. Some of them um, will be uh, a, a quiet word after, after a shift or the next day or the next week or the next month. Um, but it's really important that if, if you are finding it difficult, um, get help. Um, we've all had, I, I think most senior paediatricians and neonatologists that I've spoken to have had cases that have been quite traumatic um, and it has always been a, a great source of comfort to me as a consultant that I could always talk to my colleagues um, and when I was a, a registrar and an SHO um, I always felt able to talk to maybe not the, the people I was working with on that day but certainly family members um, and other friends around as well um, and most uh, most of us are, are approachable we don't have to know the patient to understand um, a little bit about what you're going through um, and we're always 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 happy to talk to you and it is absolutely not a sign of weakness or a sign of of a problem with you if, if people are having difficulty um, dealing with a traumatic situation on the ward so a final word or maybe two and um, the key to practicing neonatal medicine is to get help early. And that goes for every grade, but particularly at ST1. If you are not sure, ask. Um, you, there's very few times in medicine where you need to make a guess. And um, you can always ask someone. And at least if you are um, having to, to guess what's wrong, um, if there's two or three of you, um, then that, that uh, discussion is likely to lead to a better decision. And um, midwives will call you a lot on the neonatal unit and it's very important to go when they call you. And I, we all know how busy life can be, um, but you never know whether that baby that they're calling you to is the one that's going to need emergency intervention and to come across to the neonatal unit. And um, it's a high stress environment sometimes and a high pressure, sorry, environment maybe on the neonatal unit. Um, and that does lead to some frayed tempers occasionally. Um, and also when, when you're not quite sure what's happening and when you're starting, it, it is very possible that you might get angry with someone or angry at a situation. Um, and if you do get angry, it's OK, but try and walk away. Walk away and tell someone about it, because in my experience, shouting very rarely makes things better. Most often it makes things worse. And also um, most people who go into paediatrics are going in to it from a, a, a standpoint of wanting to do the best for, for the people that they're caring for. And actually, everybody who comes into hospital starts off the day wanting to do the best for their patients. And most disagreements happen um, when, um, when people forget that, that that's the angle that everyone's coming from. Um, and, and disagreements arise. But you can always walk away. You can always um, shift it up to your registrar, who, if they're stressed, will shift it up to the consultants. Um, and if we're stressed, you know, we, we, we pop it up to the managers and, and we see how things are going uh, and how other people can help us as well. Um, and the last thing to say is that um, your, uh, your well being is incredibly important to us. So if you're having difficulties, come and talk to us. Um, it doesn't mean that you can skip post notes, but it does mean that we are very happy to help you on post notes or anywhere else that you might be having stress. So don't stress, don't panic. Um, we're all friends and uh, we're, we all get along um, in most units and we're all very happy. Um, although uh, I guess we've got these two leading us, so maybe we should just all panic anyway. Thank you very much. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them now. 
Um, otherwise, uh, these are my contact details um, and you can email, tweet, give me a ring at Kings. Um, always happy to, to answer any questions. Chris, thank you so much. That was, um, as always, an absolutely brilliant talk. Um, thank you. I don't know if anyone um, would like to ask Chris any questions now. Um, either unmute yourself or put a message in the chat, um, because I know that neonates is something that everyone's a little bit nervous about. So if you have any questions, please holler. Don't be shy. Typing questions is good um, because uh, my internet connection here is terrible. We have thousands and thousands of pounds of uh, ventilators here, but apparently no one can work Wi-Fi. So. Um, I apologise if I can't hear what you're saying. OK, if there are um, no questions, should we move on then? Oh, no, here we go, we've got one. Um, some, wow. You can probably read it as well as I can. Uh, <laughs> about the procedures, um, like intubations, would you advise getting involved early or wait and try them later? I think um, all procedures, um, be it uh, the exciting things like intubations or, or the um, more uh, common things like cannulation of preterm infants, are, are things that we would encourage you to get involved with as, as soon as uh, as soon as you're able to. And um, the first time you put down uh, uh, and or the first time you do an intubation will be the first time you do an intubation, and and that will be the same on your first day on the neonatal unit, and probably uh, if you if you waited three months to go forward. Um, I think what's um, really important is that when you do these procedures that you are well supervised by someone who is confident and competent to supervise you. Um, and if that's the case, then I wouldn't mind supervising an SHO on their first day. Um, and I wouldn't mind supervising them later on as well. So it's, it's really um, about who you've got supervising you and when those opportunities present themselves rather than worrying about waiting until you're two or three months in. Um, there's another question. Um, are there sessions for these um, about the procedures and things? So um, here at King's, we, we do have um, things like uh, intubation mannequins um, and indeed simulation sessions where we go through the management of, of these infants. I think intubation is, is something that in general is, is a frustrating thing because as yet I have yet to find a simulation or indeed a, a mannequin that accurately um, describes the airway and, and the things that you, you need to do in order to be successful in intubation. Um, but certainly um, watching others do it um, is, is a very good um, way of learning if you've never seen one before. Um, but also um, hopefully your, your registrars and other colleagues can show you um, on, a, on a mannequin first before you go and do it. In terms of cannulation, um, watch a um, uh, watch uh, uh, someone put a cannula in first and then um, go for it. And um, the plastic arms again tend not to be quite so useful for neonatal cannulation. And more importantly is um, that with all procedures, but particularly with cannulation, you'll try it and be unsuccessful. And that's like that. That's the same at the weekend. I put a, tried to put a cannula in and I was unsuccessful. These things um, follow you through until um, you are a consultant. The important thing is to have a, an idea of what you're going to do when you are unsuccessful. So who are you going to phone next to ask to help? Not to just keep prodding away until um, the baby looks like a snowman with bits of cotton wool stuck all up their arms, legs and everywhere else. Um, but ask for help early. Um, 
and um, when someone is successful, watch them do the cannula and try and pick up what they've done that's different to you um, to get the cannula in. Sometimes it's just blind luck and it's really annoying and you go away feeling really angry and have to have a cup of coffee and a lot of chocolate to um, make yourself feel better. But in general, um, you can normally pick up little hints and tips every time you watch someone else do a procedure, particularly if you've had difficulty with that procedure before. Anything else from anybody else? I think everyone's happy. Okay. And I think okay. either my, my internet is terrible or everyone else's internet is terrible or there's just an awkward silence. So I'm going to fill that silence by saying goodbye and um, that we really look forward to you coming to things, um, if not this year, then next year. Um, and do drop me an email or, or a line if there's anything at all um, that I can help you with. Great, Chris, thank you so much. Um, next, I'm going to introduce Dr. Anne Davies, who is um, an epic consultant at, at West Middlesex, um, who's going to talk to us about safeguarding.